Welcome to the Real Advisor Podcast, T-R-A-P, TRAP. Please follow us and join in the conversation on Twitter at Advisor Podcast, where you can suggest ideas and themes you'd like the TRAP team to discuss. Also remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a six out of five star review on iTunes. Doing all this really, really helps us, which means we can do more to help you. Now let's head over to the studio for the latest pile of trap. Yes, indeed, dear Trappists. Welcome back to episode 14 of the Real Advisor podcast, TRAP. My name is Nick Lincoln and joining me as ever are the three other horsemen of the apocalypse. Carl, the voice widger. Alan, the storyteller Smith, and Andy Hart. Gentlemen, we have a show packed full of absolutely nothing. So, Andy, with your normal energy and verve and vigor, give us give us three of the latest reviews we've had on Apple, please, my friend. Sure, no problem. The first review is from Don1987, entitled, Totally Worth Your Time, Five Stars. Very enjoyable, great content, and relaxed vibe. Next up, we have LUFCLK, entitled, Insightful Five Stars. Great job so far. Really insightful and topical episodes. The meaty review for today is from Jimmy Floyd, 1982, entitled Coffee Break Chat in a Podcast Form. Uh, The main body of his review is, having gone from advising in a medium-sized firm to working alone earlier this year, this podcast is one of the ways of replacing some of the invaluable coffee break chats I had daily with my former colleagues. Lighthearted and easy listening, yet informative with some of with some honest debate and topics of the day in our profession. That's it. Over to you, Nick. Brilliant. Thanks, Andy. Good stuff. Nick, Nick, may I just briefly interject there on that last comment, which I thought was very relevant and insightful, because what we know is post-COVID, the world's kind of moved away from all being in an office all the time. And all those, I've always talked about the kind of the water cooler moment, as the Americans call it, the coffee, what did he say, the coffee, around the coffee machine or whatever. Though, and I think maybe that's part of our success is that these are kind of chats like you would have just sort of bumping into a colleague having conversations so I thought I I didn't consider that before but that's kind of well said actually thank you to the reviewer okay very good so topical tidbits to give this episode episode 14 a time stamp the last episode we kind of opened up a little bit and talked about the uh, the struggles that we all have we all have struggles and some are more obvious than others um some are external and some are internal but for advisors there's a lot of pressure that comes with our job and carl you you had some very good feedback i think carl on the way that you, you opened up in the last episode yes well look uh episode 13 was about um i suppose the challenges that some of our clients may face when they're coming to that transition into the third act from selling a business and what do i do now and then we kind of did discuss a little bit about the challenges that us as advisors have and um yeah maybe um it was a little bit uncomfortable to to be vulnerable but uh that's what happened and that's how the 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 chat transpired a couple of people have reached out to me um since um obviously i won't be disclosing who or the nature of those conversations because they are private but all i'd say is um look you know, to, to all advisors out there, but but literally to everybody, you know, keep doing the stuff that you need to do in order to keep yourself at the, you know, peak mental and physical fitness. It's so, so important. And that's a, you know, that's something you just got to be so consistent at, at. And and then my kind of overriding feeling, and we did have a chat about this off air, is you never know what people are going through. And I think, you know, if you kind of have that at the back of your head all of the time, I think we can all just be maybe that tad little bit nicer to each other. Um, and I think that makes all of the difference. Um, except, of course, if you're the chairman of a podcast and you're making a bags at the technology like you did this morning. You deserved everything you got, Nick, this morning. Uh, that's right, Carl. You continue to be nice, my friend. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Hart, you've got, uh, you want to talk to us about Vanguard's fund ratings, yeah, I'll, I'll introduce this. This is something that somewhat boils my blood, so I'll try and tread carefully. Um, various different fund managers and fund houses do this, and they obviously rate the different funds that they're uh, offering to clients. And obviously, we've got to somewhat navigate this from a sort of compliance, regulatory, real-life, grown-up investor point of view. Um, so Vanguard, on their risk scale, so they call them risk ratings, which, again, what risk are you trying to 
you know, define, clarify. That's the first thing that's always very unclear. It's generally usually, sorry, it's usually around volatility, which is one flavor of risk. There's many other flavors of risk that are far more dangerous to our clients than volatility. But anyway, the whole fund management industry seems to be fixated on risk being volatility. So they've got a scale of, I think, one to seven. So they, they categorize all of their different funds from one to seven. And it's so any fund managers, are, I'm just going to focus on Vanguard because it's a company I you know think highly of and use their funds. So the, on the four out of seven risk scale, they've got their 20% global equity funds, 40% global equity funds, and 60% global equity funds. So their 20, 40, 60 global equities, advisors listen to this, know what I'm talking about. They've grouped them between four, four out of seven. The, the five out of seven funds are the 80% global equities and the 100% global equities fund. The reason why this sort of got flagged to me, I think Alan Smith, you you, you highlighted this, didn't you? The the UK index link guilt fund with Vanguard is now a six out of seven on their risk rating, which is incredibly high. So yeah, it does after, show after me the, the event. It wasn't six months ago. After the event, yeah. exactly. It would, it would have been one or two out of seven mm. on the scale prior to something that's never happened happening. That's welcome to the world of investing. Uh, we've never seen that before until we've seen it. Um, so, yeah, that's what, I mean, to me also, one of the biggest risks is low return. This is something that we don't talk about ever. Uh, I think this needs to come to the fore. There is a huge risk of low returns. You know, investing is freedom. Freedom is opportunity. We are in the wealth creation business for our clients. You can do a lot of good with with your wealth, either that's for your family or care, causes you care about. So anyway, back to the fund ratings. Yeah, so it's interesting that the uh, fund that has historically been super low risk where people put almost cash-like money uh, in that type of fund over the years, and now it's a six out of seven on the risk scale. Risk, according to them, I believe is volatility, not all the other flavors of risk that we can unpack. So yeah, I just thought I'd I'd highlight it. Uh, Also, advisors still live in this world where they think 100% global, or some advisors think 100% global equities portfolio is a 10 out of 10 on the risk scale. It is not. You know, 10 out of 10 on the risk scale, in my opinion, is, you know, crypto, things that are working now, you know, individual stocks, you know, there's so many way higher risk um, asset classes than 100% global equity port- global equity portfolios. Um, but it's interesting that Vanguard have put their 100% global equity portfolio as a f- 5 out of 7 and not a 7 out of 7, which is great. So they've sort of got that right. Um, so again, it's just having that conversation uh, about where returns come from, what asset classes you put your money in, uh, uh, and then obviously having a conversation about being calm through all market cycles. So that's my bit on that. Who's, uh, who's Alan, next? you had your hand raised. I think. Yeah, j- just um, as you very kindly acknowledged me there, Andy. I'll acknowledge you. Something I think you said or wrote about a while ago, which was, and it was kind of about, you know, words are weapons. How you describe things are really important. If you said Vanguard or anyone said, do you want a high return fund or a low return fund? What one do you choose? Oh, I want the high return. Everyone would say I want the high return. And then you say, great, we can deliver that to you. It's a bit more volatile in terms of short-term volatility than the other ones, but you can expect, no guarantees, you can expect over the longer term, a higher return. Well, yeah, again, what one do you want? Just, you know, just, so that is just how you describe things yeah, uh, yeah. is really important. Just to me immediately jump in there, the real life returns for these funds that I'm talking about with Vanguard, over the last 10 years of real life returns – the Vanguard Life Strategy 20 fund over the last 10 years, if you invested £10,000, 10 years later, you would have £13,000 in that fund. So over 10 years, it's gone from 10000 to 13000 The same investing journey, but chosen via a different fund, the Vanguard Life Strategy 100 fund, has turned £10,000 into £25,000. And the journey... Of the 20% fund from 10 to 13 and the other one from 10 to 25, yes, obviously, the the result is very different. The volatility along the way is not that extreme if you see these two charts. So for me, the biggest risk in that fund, the 20% fund, is the low returns. Why do we not talk about the risk of low returns? You know, there's the risk of capital loss, there's the risk of inflation, there's a risk of volatility. And the biggest risk in my world is the risk of low returns. We don't speak about this enough. Um, obviously, you know, people like ourselves, real advisors, work with real clients. And and also we deal with people, I don't know, in their 70s, 80s, 90s that are a little bit short of money now. It would be, and it would be great if they had a bit more. Had one of us rocked up 
30, 20, 10 years ago, told them the truth about investing, where the returns are going to come from, and they followed that, um, they'd have more wealth now and they could do better, more things with it, you know, uh, more opportunities, et cetera. Anyway, I've sort of spoken a bit about this. Um, Nick, any thoughts on that? No, I think you covered that well. Uh, are we ready to move on? Yep. Yeah, okay. I just it's taken 14 episodes, but Andy, that was really, really good. Well done. <clears throat> oh, thanks. <laughs> Now, we're we're, we're uh, all following up from your episode last week. We're all being kind to each other. I'm feeling very, unco- <laughs> feeling very uncomfortable right now. Shut up. Shut up. Alan, Thank you. Thank you've you. got, that's better, you've got a conference you want to uh, tell us about. Yes, um, Advisor 3.0, which um, people may have uh, learned about, heard about, run by the incomparable Abraham Okasonia uh, and his team at Timeline. Um, one one thing that's very interesting to me is one of the keynotes there is Seth Golden, and Seth is I know that not everyone loves him. I'm a big fan. I think he's uh, I think he's a marketing genius. I think the way he describes things and articulates things, we can all learn from. He's speaking at the conference. Um, but we all know there are a handful of conferences, in my opinion, which are worth attending. Obviously, humans under management would be at or close to the top of that list. But I think. Um, I, I think this is obviously the first time that Abraham and his team are running Advisor 3.0. I think there's something for everyone. I'm even doing a little bit there as well, but don't let that put you off. It's in May. can't remember the date. We put a link in the show notes if anyone's interested. Um, it looks good. The content just looks really good. I personally like to show up to maybe three conferences during the year. This will be one that obviously I'm attending as well as Humans Under Management and maybe one more. That's it. Thanks. Okay, great stuff. And thank you for that. So I mentioned VCTs, I think, in the last episode, briefly, venture capital trusts, and this kind of fear that I have that I'm not I'm not the complete IFA I should be or could be because I don't recommend VCTs to my clients. And uh, interestingly, on a group that I'm a member of that we'll talk a bit about later on, actually, the IFA Forum, which has about 200 IFAs in it. Um, and somebody else started the thread about VCTs, and it's amazing how many IFAs came back and said, "I would not touch these. <laughs> I would not touch these products um, with with a barge pole." So uh, one guy, I won't give any names, but one IFA, and he said, "Always remember that the person on the other side of the trade is eyeing you up as their exit slash escape plan. Plus, all the truly good stuff gets picked off by the boys in the city. The rest then that reaches retail clients out in the provinces, you generally wouldn't touch with a ten foot pole." And then somebody else said about VCTs, and this is a guy who's had a business for 30 years. Uh, you succinctly put into words the reason why I've never, ever sold a VCT. So just for my, just interesting that, I, you know, we, we, we feel compelled sometimes to talk about products that we, we know are probably not suitable for the end investor. I don't think that doesn't mean we're independent and financial advisors. Maybe from a regulatory, strict regulatory interpretation, it probably does. But uh, um, I'm no longer quite so worried about, about that. Um, just before we go, unless you've got any, anyone got any points on that? Um, the Six Nations Rugby, that is, uh, it's been a brilliant tournament this today. I mean, th- this last batch of games might have been the weakest slate of the day, but they were still it, still really pretty good games generally. Um, Carl, go on, you're, 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 you're enjoying your moment in the sun. Talk us through your thoughts. Uh, we're only three games in. We've a couple of games to go. So I, I'll False just, humility, listen to I, him. I, I, I'll just hold fire, but uh, very, very impressed. Ireland with their second string team out to um, to conquer Italy, who I thought, in fairness, Italy were massively improved this year from previous years. Yeah, um, yeah. I didn't watch Scotland and France. Well, I, d- I did watch the other game, um, and whew, it was pretty boring. Yeah, well, the only it, team to put Italy away properly so far have been England. That's um, it's telling, I think, as the World Cup gets nearer and nearer. I think they had the same; they scored the same amount of points as Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it, the Scotland France game it, was fantastic. You can see the same amount of points as Ireland. It does look like it's going to come down to the last game of the tournament, which is Ireland against England in Dublin. <laughs> That's England might get three bonus points and, and, and snatch the championship. Such a, such a, but yeah. we'll How do you see. get three bonus points? You get one for four <laughs> tries. Four tries. <laughs> yeah. And how do you get a losing bonus? But that surely wouldn't be good enough. Nah. No. You missed anyway. a good game, Carl. In all honesty, the Scotland as a, as a yeah, Scotland, great game. Scotland fan, yeah, the loss, but wow, it was just entertaining. This is the in all my years of watching Scotland, it's the most positive I've ever been, really. But I just love the way France, they play rugby. France I think they're the most entertaining a, a, rugby team in the world right yeah. now. But you just don't know what you're going to see. You see genius and, at, and chaos at the same time. Got there, was two, there was two two red cards. Yeah, I believe the French one was ridiculous. Yeah. Was it? 
Yeah, the guy was. A, I mean, when when the Scottish guy, they were both they were both valid sending off. But yeah, when the Scottish were. guy got sent off, I thought, oh god, this is that's the end of the match. And then about yeah. two seconds later, the. <laughs> This French, French ball which just literally dived into just him. goes in just, with his head. Yeah. Head by yeah. the player. It's just like, where did that come from? And then, and it, then I mean, there was a great Finn Russell. We saw all sides of Finn. You know, he's brilliant. Yeah. But then he had that horrendous long pass yeah. which just wasn't on. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. it was brilliant. I was obviously, you know, I was rooting for Scotland and they they nearly did it. And it was, mm. um, you know, the valiant loser thing can be an annoying tag. But in years gone by, they would have been humped. Yeah. That scoreline would have been. 19 nil down they were early on. Yeah, Came yeah, which, which that that didn't reflect the runner play at all. Like France got some sort of l- lucky early points. Yeah, yeah. So there's forward passes. They both look good to me. And uh, yeah. anyway, Scott, we're getting forward pass. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Shall we now move on to the meat and potatoes of the show? And um, we've got two two topics here, and they're both. I think one one is very topical. Shall I go with my one first, guys? If you're okay with that, and then Alan will go on to your suggested one. Okay, cool. So yeah, um, yes, please. Huh. The role of the role of ambiguity in financial planning o- over the years, and this started with people like William Bengen and then Wade Fowl. I think that's how you say his surname. And Michael Kitts has kind of joined into it. This whole safe withdrawal rate and having guide rails, and you do this and you do that, and talking almost in the abstract about how you can get a sustainable rate of income from a portfolio, which seems to discount any kind of human element whatsoever. And I think there's a little bit of a just a little bit of a pushback. I think we certainly embrace the idea that financial planning involves a heck of a lot of ambiguity. Okay, it's not what's your tolerance for, for or capacity for loss. It's what's your tolerance for ambiguity, right? You have to understand that what we do, we, we try and make really, really informed guesses for our clients, best guesses for our clients for the, for the 30, 40 year retirement, but there are no guarantees. And this paper came out from a guy called... Um, I think it's David um, Blanchett and another US guy um, in that in that same field as uh, there's other chaps I mentioned and there's a link to it in the so-called show notes in which he goes through research 1500 people in that retirement 50 age 50 to age 70 how would they feel that if in retirement they had to cut back on their spending because their portfolio returns were down or the markets were down or what have you and, and guess what it turns out that adults are quite capable of making quite rational decisions. And they can, they will cut back on their spending if their portfolios suffer a prolonged downturn. And to, 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 to quite a to quite a degree, I've got to put my glasses on to, to read this now as I made some as I made some notes. Um, yeah, uh, and and I just think we we have this condescending approach, and I, I'm not I don't want to sound like I'm berating the regulator. However, the regulator does force us to have a condescending approach to our clients and not treat them as adults. So we give them these mumbo jumbo questionnaires. We give them the endless key features documents. We we bombard them with risk warnings. We give them, as Andy alluded to at the top of the show with Vanguard, these meaningless fund risk ratings that can just change based on what's happened in the last year or so. Suddenly, so suddenly a, a relatively safe index linked guilt fund goes to being a high risk fund just because the fund manager says so. Yeah, it's, yeah, it can't it's, touch it's like, it. Yeah. And, th- and this research is really interesting. People, you know, people are adults. As long as you've got your essential spending covered in retirement, people are quite willing, and they will trim back for a year or two if, if on, on the on the non essentials on the discretionary spending. I think, and they're way more willing to do that than we perhaps perceive it to be the case. And I think if we just have these conversations with clients, they'll be responsive to it if they if we enter a prolonged down period and they're and they're, and they're and their portfolios are suffering, people will be adult. They'll say, yeah, we'll just cut back for you or two. We get it, you know. It, what I don't understand, for me, the thing is, when you're working, say you're working three to four decades, you've got no certainty of income in that period whatsoever. You're going to change jobs. If you're running a business, you've got no certainty. You know, you might go out of business. I, I've got a client uh, who, who, uh, who I had an annual planning meeting with this week, and she works at Tesco. She's been there now for just over a decade. And this is her fifth time where her job is up for appraisal when they're looking at the systems and the staffing and everything fifth and she's been through it five times and always got through it yeah. but this time it's looking a bit dodgy so this, and, and people change jobs what over the course of a four decade working period eight nine times nowadays so there's no certainty ever of income when you're in the employment stage of your life and you've got mortgages to pay so why do we suddenly Leading think there has to, to be it, yeah. absolute certainty in retirement you know there has to be a degree of ambiguity and I think the important thing is that we, as real financial advisors, tell you know, explain to our clients this fact. Um, you know that nothing is guaranteed. If you want guarantee, if you want guarantee with your money, die today. All right, that's the safest way you can assure you never run out of money. Just drop dead. Uh, aside from that, all bets are off. Um, so I thought that was. Uh, I think this, 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 just highlighting how ambiguity is important and being on- again, it's always about being honest and transparent with people, isn't it? We, we cannot, we cannot give you black and white answers. You can Monte Carlo yourself down a black hole if you want to. 
it ain't it doesn't mean anything at the end of the day guys any thoughts i can i'll shall I just jump in here at this stage uh so 100 percent agree with you nicholas this is this is a version of extrapolation isn't it? We assume something's just happened or something's recently exactly. happened. It's always going to happen. It's going to get cons- cons- you know, worse or better or whatever. It works the other way as well. The danger of straight line cash flow forecasting is we assume it's always going to be or potentially could be could be good. If you have if you're on a cash flow model and it looks you're absolutely fine for the rest of your life, it might not be the case. So there are no guarantees here. The other thing that's never factored in is the rate you, you mentioned one, Nick, which is job security, for example. But there's a whole lot of other variables that are never factored in. So you've got health. Health is one. This is assuming you're always going to be healthy enough to work or create an income or whatever. Um, there is political things, tax rates. You assume something's going to happen and the tax rate doubles. Well, again, outside of your control. Um, God forbid, what if you got divorced? All of a sudden, all your things on track, you've suddenly you know, walked away from... <laughs> you, you put it this way, your personal finance, your wealth is significantly different to what it was before. So there's multiple just life associated variables of which there are no guarantees. And this just demand or expectation for absolute guarantee and a 4% withdrawal rate will keep you safe and all that wrong. So your point is well made, Nick. It's about being grown up. It's about being, you know, essentially human having the kind of right brain skills to advise, consult, really go deep with your clients, what's important to them. And it's just, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a compass. It's not a specific, it's not a map. It's not a just telling you exactly where you must go. It's just telling you the broad direction of where, where you are today and where you need to be one, three, five, ten 10 years from now. That's all this can be. So I completely agree with you. All the academics that are demanding precise science behind it, uh, it, it it's not true. As we know, you know, Good quality outcomes are more of a human and a personal sort of issue than they are a scientific or a maths one. That's my thoughts. What do you think, Mr. Widger from Ireland? Yeah, I think um, I think Nick kind of hit the nail on the head there when he said, you know, it's it's when you're planning for people who are somewhere between fifty and seventy, you're doing a fifty year plan. Now, if you're doing a fifty year plan for someone, there's only one thing absolutely sure is that that plan is wrong. Because mm. you you just there are we've you you just said it, Alan. There are too many variables. So I I think the point is that people, however, do like to have some semblance of a plan, and I think that's why financial planning and being real financial planners, um, it's so important that we impress on every single person that comes through our doors that it's a process. It's yeah. not a one off. So you can have a beautiful document saying, here's your financial plan and good luck and good night. And we think you should go into X, Y, and Z. Well, that's what the private banks do, right? That's not what real financial planners do. They map out um, a, a, a rough plan over a long period of time. But where you can get specific is the first few years of the plan. So on the one hand, we're trying to say, trying to encourage people to look to the long term or whatever. But then on the other hand, as financial planners, we can look to, well, how much money are we going to need to spend over the next couple of years? And we don't have that money in the market. So we do have that money available. And, you know, it's, it's, it's so, so important that you stress that to the clients. And I think, you know, we've all been through it over many, many years now with, with, with certain clients. And, uh, you know, the, 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 yeah, the, 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 best, the best meetings for me in terms of financial planning are when the clients are standing up and they're, they're looking at their, their plan and they're saying, and what have we put this in here and what have we put that in there? So they get engaged in the plan, but, but they understand the short-term you know, focus, but also the long-term focus. And I, I, I think, um, you know, to, to summarize Alan's point, it's the, the famous Mitch Anthony phrase, you know, when life goes in transition, money moves. And you don't know what that transition might look like. And it can be good, it can be bad, and it can be bloody ugly. Um, so, you know, we're, we're trying to give, you know, guidance over a long period of time, but that's all we're trying to give. And trying to be precise, or uh, I agree with you, Nick, this um, guardrails and all that stuff, they're, they're just useless financial products that are not required, in my opinion. Carl Widger, once again, showing the wisdom of the Irish. Amazing. No matter what Carl tells us, no matter what they do, 
No matter that Carl's Irish His boy band days are through Carl, are you okay, mate? I've got a restraining order here yes, from Louis indeed. Walsh. Yes, indeed, dear it's Travis. Right. <laughs> we know Carl as one of the leading lights in the, <laughs> new, in the in the Irish financial services world, and Metis Ireland is definitely that. Um, they used to be Metis Norway, but then they realised they were based in Ireland and changed their name to Metis Ireland. <laughs> Carl, <laughs> Carl is a very serious man in this field. However, what you might not know, dear Trappers, is his tortuous artistic bat life. And for the last two decades or so, Carl's had a running feud with legendary boy band manager Louis Walsh. Carl was, of course, a founding member of Boyzone in the late 1990s and then got thrown out by Mr. Walsh just as they were on the verge of megastardom and eternal riches. And at the time, Mr. Walsh said, Carl's a lovely guy, but he's got all the musical talent of a newt. Right. I, I, I just have to interject that Carl, without doubt, is the most popular member of this little grouping. Wherever I go, bump into people and say, I listen to your podcast. Carl? You're all right, Alan. <laughs> Nick and Andy, oh, God, they're awful. But that guy, Carl, he seems a really lovely guy, which yeah. is true. I have news for you. That's because they know the three of you and they don't know me. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. that's like tallest of the seven dwarves, right? <laughs> uh, could I just point out that that little interlude from Nick was a, a total and utter surprise to me and it won't be happening again. <laughs> So your boy band days really are over. Okay, back to me to close up. Right. Back, what do you think, Andy, about what back we're talking about? Back to me to close about? up this Not point. The, yeah. Okay. Not the boys so where, band thing. where are we going with this? Yeah, financial planning at retirement, leading up to retirement, in retirement. Uh, yeah, this is my space. I get really excited about this. I sort of straddle both camps. I can do the sort of science of it, but I understand how important the art of it is. It is all about, yeah, progress, not perfection. Um, in, it, I mean, so, yeah. I, I I build a you know voyant financial plans for all of my clients you know deep in this space. Um, I am a fan of the four percent rule. I think it's a good uh, rule of thumb, not in terms of you know uh, agonizing over sort of you know sticking to it, but I quite like reverse engineering the four percent rule. When someone says how much you want to spend per month, let's say they say I want to spend a thousand pounds per month, you times it by three hundred. That's how you basically achieve the 4% rule. So if someone says I want to spend £3,000 a month for the rest of my life, you times it by 300, you get 900,000 golden coins. That's how much you need if you're applying the 4% rule. So I'm, I'm a fan of that. I also get what people say about straight line projections. That's why we call them forecasts, not really financial plans. And I am cautious on all of my assumptions. So I'm, get, I'm killing them at 100, which means the money probably needs to last longer than they need it for. So that's my first cautious assumption. My investment returns are a lot lower than what I have been able to achieve for them long term, uh, and I probably overestimate their expenses. So, yeah, um, I'm 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 happy with it being, uh, you know, straight line projections, and I understand the limitations around them. I have got software that allows me to throw in, you know, endless Monte Carlo um, scenarios. The good thing about that sort of modeling is it usually says all roads lead to global equities, um, which is also something that else else that we bang on about quite a lot. Um, so yeah, uh, that's my final point. Uh, Nick, okay, back to well, you. I think we're kind of in a for, for, we've kind of agree, agreed our way through this episode so far. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? Things, things, things are uh, things definitely change all the time. I, I, I mean, this straight line. I know Abraham has a beef about this, doesn't he? Straight line project. Well, what else are you going to use, man? You just you know you got to you had to start somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't, I can't just Carlo Fluey. Monte Carlo. No, forget it. No, you're right. It's just it's. You know, everything goes but back also, to it. it's just it's just a guide. No one said it was guaranteed, yeah, yeah, yeah. for God's sake. But I've been building real life plans for my clients for the last twelve years. So where I told a client twelve years ago, let's say in two thousand and eleven, where they actually are in twenty twenty three, it's not miles off where I predicted where they'd be in two thousand and eleven, because the software stores all of the plans. So I could get a client up who I'm seeing next week and say, Right, let me go back ten years ago and I'll show you the plan from, from ten years ago where I thought you're gonna to be today. And it's scary how accurate it is. This is their expenses. This is their liquid assets. This is their non-liquid assets. Uh, again, I know that from being you know, a real planner and building these plans. Yeah. And, and so to assume that a client will just carry on living their life when the world has changed beyond all recognition. I mean, those of us who were advising real-life clients, real-life real life families, real-life human beings in 2008, mm. as I was, building, having built – Real financial plans and forecasts and all the rest of it. And then the market, as we all know, it I mean, it absolutely cratered, regardless of what portfolio you were in. 
you were underwater by a significant way. And I was having client meetings. I was you know, coming in, they were saying, you know, what's the damage? What does it look like? And the great thing about a 30, 40, 50 year plan is that even in the worst case scenario, you know, you, you, you haven't lost everything, you know, and you've got to assume there'll be a recovery at some point because there always is using history as our guide. And therefore, I, I never forget uh, having a, this is not a story, just a, an anecdote, but I'm at one, one, one client, I could, I could actually, I could tell you an anecdote about a story, but no, that's a different one. I had one, one client who I, um, you know, uh, was advising then a, a lovely guy who was saying, and he used to travel to the Caribbean on holiday every year. And he said, he looked at it and he thought, okay, we, um, looks like we're going to have to go cattle class this year. I'm still going, I'm still going to Barbados, but I'm going to have to downgrade my lifestyle for a year or two rather. And obviously that's a, an extreme example, uh, just to make a point. But that's the thing. People generally have got a certain amount of discretionary expenditure that, would, that they enjoy spending, but there might be through lots of circumstances beyond everyone's control, a time when we're going to have to tighten our belt for a year or two, you know, and that's, so your income expectation goes down during that period of time. It doesn't continue to go up in line with inflation or whatever. So <clears throat> I think the bottom line here is how you, as you started it, Nick, is treating our clients like adults, like grown ups, and having sensible, mature, pragmatic conversations. That's, that's the sort of beginning and ending of this whole whole debate okay really. good i think we can draw a line under that and just just, just i think carl's point is very well made the plan is still born it's the planning and if you're a young advisor and you're coming into this profession and you're thinking god how do these people make these forecasts for clients and isn't the pressure on the well, the fact is we you, you know hopefully you understand that we we do it we're we're kind of just doing it we're wading through the the reads with the clients on a year on year basis and adapting and changing things as it goes along there are no certainties the important thing is just to convey that message to clients okay We've done that one to death. Um, the next meat and potatoes subject is something that Mr. Smith pulled into um, our agenda, and that's a sort of a, a back to basics thing for early career financial planners. To, what what things could could w- would add real value to people starting off on their journey as real financial planners, Mr. Smith? If you want to start with that one, yeah, I'll just I'll just open this up with my thoughts because I know that I have been contacted and i'm sure i think i know that all you guys have as well to one degree or another various various sorry through social media or through various other means in the in certainly since trap launched and probably before from people early stage career it could be could be financial planners could be doing different roles within financial services generally and the kind of classic can i pick your brains conversation so i think rather than me necessarily go back to one or two people, if we just sort of a one to many, and it's just an open conversation. If I was, I don't know, 23, 25, in my 20s, or even my 30s, and I was early stage career in financial planning, what are the things, knowing what I know as a veteran, <laughs> um, what would I what, what would I like to do? What should I do in order to maximize and further my career? And as I've reflected on this, inevitably, there's going to be an element of sort of restating or reconfirming things that we've talked about in the past because you know there are some basic rules of the game and so you know we end up repeating them because it's true and they work so i have you know the, the, and, and the, other, the other thing is it's, it's not a there isn't a silver bullet there's not just one or three things that you must always do it's a combination of lots of things and, and different things to different people but if i were younger and i was early stage career and particularly if i wanted to build a, a you know build a client base you know, become a financial planner uh, and grow my audience and, and grab attention and, and all that sort of stuff. The, the starting point is to go back to the question of what sort of people do I prefer to deal with? Who are the type of clients, the type of profile? And so it's that magic word, Mr. Lincoln, niche. What are the sort of people I'd like to uh, and enjoy um, advising, speaking, and spending time with? So I'd so consider. What do you know now? You wish you could like go back and tell you from ten years ago as you were getting started. Niching is important. I, I wish I would have committed sooner. I wish I would have known the, the benefits of niching. You know, I think if you have a niche with a good-looking website and you really focus. On- is that um, is that Morgan Housel speaking? Kids, is- or do you, or your. You muted Nicholas. That was a, that was a guy, just an, an, an American financial planner who's being interviewed by Michael Kitsis. It was actually quite a good interview, um, but it was one of the yeah, one, oh, okay. one of the three thousand episodes from the Kitsis. 
Gets his chain. <laughs> uh, but he's he's true, despite him um, abusing the pronunciation of the word. Uh, he's true. So if I was starting again, if I was if I was that way, I would just try to get known as being the go to advisor for a community, and the narrower the better. So business owners is not a niche. Um, female founders of tech businesses between two and ten million pounds turnover is a niche, and I would. I would understand that. I would spend time with that niche. I would ask meaningful questions of that niche, such as what are your biggest financially related, personal finance related challenges? Because I think that our industry, and, the, and, I, and I use that word um, deliberately it, it, in relation to this point, um, creates products that to some parts of the community aren't relevant. Because a lot of some people may not have, you know, half a million pounds in a pension or whatever where the product exists. So I'd, I would I would speak with the niche. I'd spend time with them. I'd work out where they hang out, both digitally, online, and in real life. And I would ask some questions. And I would use those questions and those complexities and those misunderstood areas to create content. I would write a weekly newsletter. Fifty-two weeks later, you've got a book, effectively. And then the ability to repurpose a lot of that content is highly, highly valuable. So in summary, that's something I do. Identify a niche, find out what their pain points are, create regular content. Don't just write a blog once every six months or something. Every week, be consistent. You know, this is, this is you know, obviously not rocket science, but almost it's incredible because that if you do that and you show up weekly, I promise you within two or three years, you will absolutely succeed in this industry. Um, and the other thing I would say, that's just my starting point. You guys will have lots of other sort of thoughts and comments. But the other thing, that, that's an obvious one. A less obvious one is if I'm young and I don't have spouse, you know, kids, pets, all that, all that sort of thing. I mean, that sort of point in your career where you're more mobile, more options, more choices, I'd move to a city. I'd move to, a, you know, obviously, I would say move to London. But if you if London's too much, move to Bristol, move to Edinburgh, move to Birmingham, move to, I, th- I, I think proximity is really important. Where you operate from, if you are in, and, and using, uh, look, I'm an example of um, an expat is, who moved to London all those years ago. The opportunities that have existed for me are far greater than if I'd stayed where I'm from. Uh, just in terms of the people you will network with, the events which are on your doorstep that you can show up speak to, engage, learn, listen, uh, as well as the potential client base as well. So some people might think that's a bridge too far for them to actually move. But if you are serious about building a long-term career, you don't have to stay in the city forever. But spending three years or more in a larger city with greater opportunities is something I would definitely recommend to someone at that stage in their career. Um, Back to, how about you, Andy? What are your thoughts? I'm sure you've thought about this for the uh, younger generation, well, which no, you're I almost definitely, part of. I concur with your last point. Yeah, move to a major city, move to a major city, move to a major city. That's the advice to young people. Yeah, the amount of people you're going to be surrounded with, all the collisions you're going to have, all the sort of um, yeah thought leadership you're going to have around you, the network events you can go to, yada, yada, yada. yada. It's going to be uh, be endless. I mean, I think people new to this profession, they are, they're drowning in information now. There's so many YouTube channels that share information about personal finance, lots of podcasts. I'd start with Pete Matthews' podcast, Meaningful Money, in terms of the for information. I'd listen to my podcast, Meaningful Money, which is, uh, sorry, uh, Maven Money, which is slightly different. Uh, I would join mastermind groups, which I think is the, the key thing. I mean, NextGen are doing great work for people new to this profession. Again, it's the mastermind element to it. There's hundreds of people going through a similar sort of journey and people are willing to share their time. Things like Twitter and LinkedIn are also going to be quite useful. Uh, me personally, I went on the uh, Dimensional Fund Advisors courses early on in my career, completely opened my mind to asset class investing, index investing, uh, and met loads of other great people on that on that on the similar sort of journey. A couple of books to mention. I think Carl Richards' Behavior Gap is superb. Definitely read that. Got some great pictures. Pulls everything to life. It's an easy read as well. Um, I used to give that to quite a few people. Uh, if you're a financial advisor and very very serious about this business, which anyone listening to this would be, 
The Nick Murray books are fantastic. The Excellent Investment Advisor and the Behavioral Investment Counseling, I recommend you start with those two. Probably start with Behavioral Investment Counseling if you can find it. It's very hard to get. The Excellent Investment Advisor is a little bit easier to find, but a bit of a heavy read. Uh, but again, uh, fantastic. So just surround yourself with your peers. Um, as I say, you're drowning in information entering in entering this mighty profession now. You've got the PFS that also do quite a lot of online courses, live courses. You've got uh, the CII and the CISI. Again, they've got local branch meetings. Just get yourself out there and meet people, long story short. Um, yeah, over to you, Carl. Thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, I, I kind of came at this maybe slightly differently in that maybe I thought about this from a little bit earlier. So you're kind of coming out of college and I suppose what I was thinking about was, okay, what would I tell my kids to do? So I would say, you know, you got to build your, your network online and offline. So, you know, build up that LinkedIn, Twitter, and I'm sure TikTok and whatever else is, is Instagram, you know, the, that's probably where it'll be at in a few years. And, or there might be new platforms, who knows? So make sure you're building your network there with people, you know, who you want to try and do business with down the line. Um, I don't agree with you guys on the niching thing. I think you know that. Maybe that's because Ireland is that much smaller. We do have several niches here in um, Metis, but if we had only one or two, we wouldn't have a successful business, I believe. I'm open to the fact that I might be a little bit old-fashioned on that, right? Um, but that's just my belief. So I, I, I think, you know, certainly in early career, being more, more of a generalist, I think, will help you. Um, I think you should be trying to get into a real financial planning firm, you know, rather than maybe you could spend a year or two to get your exams in a private bank or a stockbroking firm or whatever right but you need to get into a real financial planning firm and you need to do that as early as you possibly can and then when you do get in there assuming you kind of progress through your exams para planning will be massive because um you know i i think um i i mentioned our pod system here in metis before so we have our private client managers and then we have our financial planners which you guys would know as para planners they sit in on the meetings you know and if it's too early for you to be a para planner and to justifiably be sitting in a meetings, you can always sit in the meetings and be a note taker because, you know, learning on the job from people who you respect, who you believe are real financial planners that you, you can, you, you can't underestimate that experience that you're going to get. I think that's absolutely massive. Um, you know, so I, I think however you can, the most important things for me would be, for my kids, if they want to go into this business, is to get into a, a, a real financial planning firm and then get into the meetings as fast as you can, you know, and, and see if, you know, maybe you could get into meetings that two or three different people are leading. Um, so you'd see different styles and maybe you can kind of match yourself up to some of those styles. And then the last thing is, um, and this is, I suppose, aimed at maybe the, the, the younger kids coming through is I have a famous phrase that I keep on saying here it's uh, keep the main thing the main thing and that's to keep the focus on you know this is my my goal ultimately to be a real financial planner so don't don't get distracted and and god knows when you're in your 20s there are so many distractions and and like one of them might be a private bank comes along and gives you a shitload of money to act as a as an advisor with them that that's not keeping the main thing the main thing if this is something you really want to do you got to, you know, formulate your plan and then you got to stick with the plan. So that's my take on it. Yeah, Nick. I think we've covered a lot of stuff there. I mean, I would say you, you, use the tech as well. I don't, I don't want to sound like I just drone on about it, but there are so many online resources now. You, the, the podcast, Andy, for sure. Um, the next gen stuff as well. But, you know, this, this, this thing that I set up, you know, this IFA forum, which was a replacement for the FinServe list that used to go in the UK back in the early, well, the 1990s and 2000s, I think. And the IFA forum, you know, it's now we've got over 200 people on it now. It's just a, a Google group, but they're all, they're all practicing um, advisors and or power planners. So they're all people involved in the advice 
Shane, there are quite a few young people on the group and you just, you know, you, you can just ask the group there any question you want and somebody in the group will come back to you with an answer because it's a steep learning curve when you're starting off and you're sometimes a little bit, you know, and, but you just, just ask. I think I, I can't speak for other professions. I don't know what solicitors and accountants are like, but I'm, you know, my, my experience and your experience and the fact we're doing this, it's a very giving profession. People are very willing to share stuff up. So the IFA forum, I think I just join that. You'll, you'll, you'll get the emails and, you know, you can opt in or opt out. T- take as many or as few emails as you want. Do something like that. Generally, you, you know, if you're young, this is a bit of a stereotype, but if you're young, you're probably quite good with tech anyway. But if you're not good with tech, make yourself good with tech because going forward, you've, got to, you've, got to, you've just got to be good with the kind of stuff that is, that is about cash flow modeling software, using that, the whole diary management systems and so forth, especially if you ever want to go out on your own. You've just, you just cannot ignore it anymore. You, you, you really can't. Um, and if you have a local peer group, like a physical peer group, join, I know that, Carl, there are ones that are taking a foot in Ireland because we talked about that before. If you have a, just maybe two or three other IFAs or power planners of a similar age and profile to you and Outlook, meet up with them from different firms and just chew the fat and just do it on a quarterly basis, but just do it. Again, because you'll just learn something from those kind of things. And the final thing is ever as and, and Andy would definitely, um, Alan would definitely agree with this. Just just read Dale Carnegie, right? Just 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 read and, and internalize the lessons from Dale Carnegie. If I have to give you one book, um, that would be where I would start. So, couple mm. couple of final points on this, um, yeah, sure. please, Nick, if that's all right. Uh, just to, we talk we talk about content a lot. People setting up blogs, setting up podcasts, YouTube channels. Uh, something that was said to me many years ago as part of the Content Marketing Academy, which was set up by a good friend of mine in Scotland. Anyway, it's uh, disbanded now. Um, any content project you take on, you should think, I've got to commit to this for 30 months, which is two and a half years. So 30 months is what was banded about with in the in the content space. So if you're going to do a podcast, do a blog, do something, do anything in the content relation space, everyone else gives up too soon is uh, the long story short of that. So if you're going to do a content project, then you should think, 30 months in your head you know you're going to be talking to an empty room you know doing videos to nobody you know for months on months on end uh, but if you can stick it and go through it tweak learn get better at whatever you're doing then hopefully there'll be um something uh rewards for you poster uh, post uh, i mean it might be quicker than 30 months but that's what you should think going into it embarking into it think that this, this is a long journey this is not a, a quick fix Pushing back on a point that Carl said about joining a good firm, totally agree. You want to end up at a good firm. What I do see issues with advisors, they're so new to the business and they end up at a too good firm too soon. And then they end up at a too good firm too soon and they stay there for a year or two. And then obviously the grass is always green and they want to go somewhere else. And I say, "Mm, you don't know what's out there. (laughs) This is a good firm. You want to stay here. Um, So yeah, you definitely want to end up at a good firm that's doing real financial planning. I started off at, you know, somewhat got to be careful at not a proper real financial planning firm, but Jesus, did I learn a lot. So when I ended up somewhere decent, I was like, wow, if I just ended up with that somewhere decent, first of all, me being me would be like, there's got to be like way better out there. No, like this is it. This, this is it. <laughs> like it's nothing better out there. That's, so, that's yeah. really, that's really insightful actually, because you're right. If you, if you are on your, let's say your twenties or early thirties, I mean, the statistics are people, as Nick sort of suggested earlier on, which is true, people move jobs quite regularly. It's a natural thing. Stay a year, a couple of years, two or three years, you're bound to move yeah, on. Yeah. But you don't realize if you are a good firm, you assume yeah. everyone's a good firm. Yeah. So I think, well, I, this is I, quite good, but I've got another opportunity down the road, or they pay me a bit more money. So I'm just going to go there. And I, whoa, 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 no, you were in a really good firm. There are very yeah. few. This no, is, I this see is it a lot. reality, harsh reality right now. There aren't that many what we call real financial planning firms who do it consistently for get a every job client, anywhere. every time. You yeah, always we, get another job. Now, that's, that's insightful. And also, and also, if you go to a not-so-well-established firm, you'll be in client meetings straight away. Like, there's people at the door, like, going, you know, like, what, me? Like, a good firm would be like, no, you've got to go through your process, and, you know, you're yeah, about 28 months you, you might be, you might be, you might be frustrated. Exactly. Yeah, you'd you be might say, oh, I want to see frustrated. clients today. Yeah, like. It's, yeah, short-term was, versus long-term. I was seeing anyone, yeah. You were at the practice over payment stage. You just want to like do it, you know, rather than worry about doing it at the best place. Anyway, yeah. The, the other thing that you said there was right. You, you commit to thirty months. Completely agree with that. Fun fact: there are, I think, in the order of four million podcasts in the world, and something like thirty percent don't have more than three episodes. 
And if you do, true. And if you do, if you produce more than I think twenty or twenty-one episodes, you're in the top five percent of podcasts in the world. We're not quite there yet, boys, but we'll soon be in the top five percent. How many podcasts? Incredible. How many podcast uh, creators do ninety-nine <laughs> episodes? So transparent. And then stop? There's more depth in a puddle. Only, only, <laughs> only one in the world in the history of podcasts. There's only been one that got to Thank ninety-nine and then stopped. Island of do one. Do you know who he is? Nick? Island of one. Okay, uh, that's. Money had uh, Hang on, Nick. Just what? Just what? A quick couple okay. of other things I'll add before we wrap wrap this up. And we have talked a lot about digital, which is absolutely nailed on. It's, it's precise. But there's in this world of digital overwhelm, I think it's quite good to go back to some basics and do the opposite of what everyone else does. And one thing that I learned, someone, a mentor of mine, very early on, uh, told me to do something, which I do do. I don't do it as often as I probably should do to this day, which is write handwritten thank you cards and thank you notes. The impact of that is just incredible versus an email or anything else like that. So getting, you know, invest in some high quality thank you cards, pay the money for it, get your pen out and write a note that's meaningful to the person, whether it's a client, a connection, and a you know, colleague, friend, whatever it might be, write a card, put a stamp on it, pop it in the post. It is, and people will not forget you if you do, if you do that. That's it. Are we there? Are we comfortable with that? Okay. Well, listen, we're 52 minutes in. Um, the time absolutely does seem to, I don't know how quiet it does, but it does seem to race by. So I guess without any further ado, we can move on to our Trappist questions. Normally Post is here by now, but I can't, oh, Christ. As if on cue, as if by magic, she's appeared at the door. And yes, Carl, you know where her hands are? They're on our bulging sack of Trappist questions. You can hear the Trappists have been stirring. They've been knocking out the questions over the last two weeks. And if you want to knock one out as well, go to the link in the pinned tweet at Advisor Podcast, or even easier, click on the, the link in the so-called show notes. Your name, your question, you will get answered. We're going through them gradually. Now, without any further ado, first one on the hit list of doom is... Actually, bloody... Is, <laughs> yeah, is Josh... I think it's this envelope. is really gummy. I've got to get the... There we go. Josh Gersler. Gersler. Who is um, a young IFA, close to me, in WD6, in... in um, Forum Wood and Josh is on Twitter as at Josh not, Gersler. He's, he's not exactly young, Nick. He might he's look somewhat young. He's younger than you. I think he's, he's yes, just he's, he's maybe. Young. Uh, Josh Gersler. Well, I, yeah, to me, trust me, with with with, with <laughs> my eyes, Nick, he's, young. he's young. Josh Gersler, who's on Twitter as at Josh Gersler. He's also on LinkedIn. And Josh says, um, what are your thoughts on back office systems? What do you use and why? And P.S. A shout out to Nick and the WD crew. Thank you for that, Josh. Uh, maybe I'll just go with this and then uh, we'll go through it. Uh, back office systems. I think they're kind of something people feel they have to have, and I just think I'm not. I'm not sure you need them anymore. And I know it's easy for me to say I'm a one man band, blah blah blah. But if you've got a decent platform, you've got a decent task management system that can have multiple users and people updating tasks. Um, you know, various power plans admin, so you can see an audit trail on the task management. You've got a calendar system that everyone can join into. I'm not sure you need these great, big, clunky, very expensive back office systems that were never built for financial services. They've always been built for other professions, and they've been trying to shoehorn into financial services. There are some interesting things going on in this area, um, some more fluid cloud-based kind of um, properly financial planning orientated back office style systems. I'll, I'll wait and see what happens. But I, I, I've survived without one for, a, for, for well, a decade and a half. So that's my thought on back office systems. But maybe if we ask, well, Andy, I think you're in agreement with that. So unless you've got something to, to add to that. Yeah, I'm pretty much in agreement there. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't use a traditional back office system, but I use loads of different tech solutions that, you know, uh, inadvertently speak to each other. So I, I'm really good at using my current setup and me and the team don't need a traditional back. I, I throw in there zero as well, Nick. I think you use fresh books. Or Creating, something. Yeah. Uh, so again, I've got a good, uh, a, yeah, I've got a good um, a, a accounts management system that tie up everything with my reporting uh, requirements. So but the, yeah, um, uh, okay. not a traditional one, but again, I'm a one person the, band. Yeah. So the, the bigger boys in the room in terms of the size of your firms and the number of RIs and staff and so forth. Uh, maybe uh, Carl, what do you, do you, I imagine I'm going to assume he use a back office system. And if you do, is it one that we would understand and recognize in the UK? Oh, God, no, it's very sophisticated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, we, 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 well, no, you can't team me up like that. This I is expect true. me not to take advantage. Um, yeah, 
We have uh, we transitioned late last year. I think I was telling you boys to Microsoft uh, Office three six five. The transition was a bit of a pain, but we really are definitely reaping the rewards and the benefits of that now. So really, really good. Um, we use uh, Tishkent, which is a CRM system designed by um, an Irish guy here, which is really good. Um, and then we use loads of other really, really good stuff that I have no idea what they're even called, other than I have some fantastic people in the team here who um, know how to run them. So really, I'm not I'm not the tech guy. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have put you on the, the spot and asked you what I'm, software supports your business, given that you're the MD. Um, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> You should have stuck to the boy band. Uh, you, look, interesting, uh, interesting that you refer to Microsoft Office 365 as a back office system or CRM. No, he didn't. He, he just mentioned he, he mentioned Tishkin that, as I, CRM. All right. Okay. I think he mentioned both, but fine. We'll let, this, let that slide. Yeah, so there's been a bit, there's been way too much agreement on this episode. So I'm going to disagree vehemently with you, Lincoln. Um, although, yeah, we are in different different styles and different I thought you were saying we're in different leagues. Yeah, we, and I was thinking, okay, survive, get another, really. just, just shoe, shoe, give me we're a good down. shoe in. Okay. Yeah, that, well, that as well. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we use, we've, we've had different, uh, you know, financial planning, IFA, what you want to call it, industry-focused programs, software programs, CRMs over the years. We are currently and have been for quite a number of years intelligent office users, I.O., which is, as I understand it, hands down the most popular uh, of all the all the systems out there. Um, and it works for us. Now, what's interesting is over the years, I speak to different advisors in our, uh, in, for example, in our mastermind group called Ideas Exchange that the three of us in the UK are members of. People often raise this. And everyone's very frustrated and usually you know, angry and pissed off about the systems not being perfect. So the, he, the, here's some news. None of the systems are ever going to be perfect. In my humble opinion, I think a lot of advisors just get frustrated early on and don't use the systems to their, their full ability. I've got a fantastic team here who've really sort of unpacked and understood and spent a lot of time in training and learning to maximize the efficiency of our our use of intelligent office. Is it perfect? No. Is it good enough? Yes, yeah, it's, it's good enough. Now, where we've got things like workflows and something A leads to B leads to C leads to D, and you've got a number of different people involved doing different things along the way, I think workflow process management is really important and you can't really well you it'd be much harder to do that via you know i don't know google reminder systems or whatever it might be you've got lots of ways of creating robust audit trails there's data information is available to us for our various reports that we have to do there's a whole list of things and well a bit like carl i am far from an expert but my you know, I, it is something because it's expensive and every now and again, when I look at our invoice, I say, do we really need this? And the answer loud and clear is yes, we absolutely do. It's the backbone to our, our setup, our operation. And I think the future is more about not looking for the ideal, you know, one-off system that is so, so good. It's about increasingly these things are all connected. So you can, you can have, in, in the past, you would have, they would all, some of these systems had a cash flow model, it had a risk profiler and a number of different things, and they were all pretty much suboptimal. So what you want to do is have one core sort of backbone system that operates and have, I've heard the phrase is APIs. I don't, really, I don't really know what it means, but it's connected to, so choose your best of breed software for all the various functions and have the whole thing be connected and run well. So that's our view. Um, over okay. to you, Nick. I think that's given that a, um, a good thrashing. Uh, we'll move on to the next one. So that is from, who is this one? From Nick DeLassa. Um, this is another poor sod. He, he spelled N-I-C. <laughs> who does that to your children? DeLassa. He's on Twitter. You, Nick, your, your parents know, called you Nick. why I Nick. suffer. Nicholas Richard Lincoln, well, Nick Dick so Lincoln. This... I mean, I, the burdens that we carry. He's on Twitter as at Comrades Nick, N-I-C. Basic question. So apologies for its simplicity, but Andy often talks about only needing to use three products for wealth building, namely pensions, ISAs, and unwrapped investment accounts, unit trust. 
So I'm curious whether or not any of you guys always rarely or never use investment bonds, either onshore or offshore, in your planning with clients, and if so, in what scenarios? Really great down in the weeds question, um, and Andy, we'll start off with you, please, sir. Uh, yeah, generally only inside trust, but yeah, for most clients, generally trying to avoid it, even with the new CGT changes coming in, but I've had a look at it. And we'll continue to monitor. But yeah, I'm sticking with the high end vanilla products. Yeah, that's a fair point. Uh, likewise, the CGT regime in the UK is getting less generous. It still seems pretty generous if handled correctly. The tax rates seem generous. And I just don't want to be back in the world of investment bonds and life assurance contracts and life assurance companies and the, the bloody awful tax calculations. So I use them occasionally for trusts. And that's it. Um, Alan? Was it um, onshore, this more the investment bond concept on onshore or no, offshore? Oh no, not sure. Yeah, um, not. Um, I'm certainly no deep expert on this, but I, I don't think we've ever used an onshore bond product. Didn't really see the advantage. Offshore bond wrappers. Uh, yeah, from time to time we would use that. There are some advantages. There are things that you can do, like um, I mean, the the, the, the tax deferred. You know, withdrawal is can be an opportunity. Uh, assigning segments of bonds to non-taxpayers, to pre-encashments, things like that. There are a few. It is kind of niche and a bit specific, but and I mean, it's, it's not a mainstream product wrapper for us at all. But there are some, particularly, yeah, wealthy clients and, yeah, if you used all your CGT allowances and a few other things. So just, it gives you a few more options. I think when you've got the ability to time when you pay tax, you have a more of a uh, an option to to mitigate or minimise, uh, in as well as well as all the other things. Again, this is a bit like the VCT conversation. Assuming you've done everything else and maxed out every other sort of mo- mainstream legit tax structure, I think there can be a place for offshore bond wrappers from time. Yeah, that's to a time. good answer. It's funny how incentives drive things. When I came in as an IFA in two thousand and one, investment bonds were like they, they were the standard. Uh, that was the kind of you do the pension, you do a PEP as it was then, and then you do an investment bond. You'd never do a GIA. Funnily enough, investment bonds paid commission of up to sort of six, seven, eight, nine percent. And when we had our RDR in this country, the sale of investment bonds fell off a cliff. Strange that, Carl. In your world, where there are still commissions and so forth, investment bonds are they are they a regular go to product? <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So. Um, they are it's uh, hopefully the industry is changing but until it does it's still an industry it's not a profession you can invest clearly on platforms and then you don't have to pay like a government levy and that kind of stuff so uh, hopefully the um, the investment business here in Ireland matures a little bit over the next while but uh, yeah well you keep fighting the fight my good friend maybe Nick Maybe Nick and Alan might know the answer to this question. Carl, 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 maybe. I mean, what's the history of investment bonds on and offshore bonds? I mean, they weren't being invented today. Why were they invented before? Why, why are they caught between this murky world of being an insurance contract versus an investment contract? Yeah, it's a whole of life, non-qualifying life assurance policy. It, I mean, it, it, it tracks its origins back to, I think, the beginning of life assurance. You right, know, 150 years or ago or something. Yeah, something like that. I, I, you know, it's, it was a way for the insurance companies to get into the... Um, the investment management business, wasn't it? Um, but but yeah, whoever said, world. you know, the, yeah. who thought, okay, we can have five percent of original capital back over twenty years, and it's tax deferred. All these who sat down one day and thought, what do, and you can have a thousand, thousand segments. Seg- yeah, 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 thousand yeah. segments. Um, thank. And is it? Are you are you doing a partial across all segments or individual oh segments? God. And it's like, oh, well, that's a whole other story. You don't want to go there. They are yeah. there's a complexity level because we get, we, that, we, one, we, get we, that one wrong, and you've got we, a big tax bill. We do know other advisors that are massively pro offshore bonds. I mean, they deal with, yeah, uh, let's call them uh, high net worth clients, super high net worth, whatever you want to flavor of the day sort of uh, description term is. Um, but yeah, they're very, very pro them. Yeah, I know, I know a lot of advisors that are very pro offshore bonds. Um, and these are clued up advisors, so they're not doing it you know, for commission or anything like that. It's the, the these same advisors are probably re- doing a lot of, they're probably recommending a lot of VCTs as well. That, that mm, these are no. things which are i think there's a place for them they are they are niche but they, i wouldn't rule them out completely offshore bonds i'm right. sure i can't i might have missed something but i can't really see 
the benefit of this onshore structure. We don't have the same. Well, maybe, well, anyway. Um, I hope that chairman, answers the question. Chairman, yeah, chairman okay, are you fine, still with fine. us? Okay, could, so could we the, move um, on? The Perhaps third the and one. final question that we've got, I think, is um, this, this has got a South African stamp on it, looking at the envelopes. So this will be from our good friend, Lunch Club Dirk. Dirk Graneveld, which I guess is a Dutch heritage. It's a, again, it's a car crash of a spelling. I'm not going to read it out, but we love you, Dirk. Dirk, you're on <laughs> you're on Twitter as at Dirk Graneveld. <laughs> not that it helps anybody, really. Lunch Club Dirk here. When it comes to building a business by bringing in younger planners... What is the best way to remunerate them and also allow, enable them to buy equity in the business without simply the founder supplying the funding? What red flags should one look out for through this process? God. Right. Andy and I are sitting this out. Alan, Andy, Alan, oh, Carl, if you want to have a stab. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they, this is a this is the big, this this could be a meat and potato subject in and of itself. So for the in the time limitation we've got, uh, yeah, so it's 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 really tricky. Um, first of all, th- this thing about buying equity in the business. So what's happened over the last dozen or 20 or so years is huge amounts of value have been created in financial planning businesses. And they're now worth, even sort of mediocre businesses, are worth hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pounds. And the opportunity for an advisor or, or a sort of junior or younger person in your team to purchase it at fair value, even with a discount or a significant discount, I just think it's out with the realms of reasonable possibility. So so, so let, someone could buy, let's say, 2%, 5% of a business, but it's going to cost them, I don't know, I'll just make up a number, 50, I haven't done the maths, but 50,000, 100,000 pounds. I mean, really, are you going to allocate that from your, at this, you know, we've referred to already about the early stage financial planners and, and early career people. Most haven't got access to that amount of capital, obviously. Most would be reluctant, I think, to borrow it. To say, I now am the proud owner of 3% of a small, privately owned, you've got a tiny minority stake. I don't really see that working successfully, uh, uh, either for, for anyone. Oh, the alternative is giving giving them shares. I don't think that's reasonable or fair, not reasonable to the founder of the business. And it does, certainly in the UK, create some significant tax implications if you do so. I do, however, believe in um, go- aligned goals and incentives. There are a number of different kind of options type structures that you can create. don't have the time to go into it now, um, but things like growth shares, there's a number of different s- strategies without, without overcomplicating it as well. There's a good, um, I can't remember, I've forgotten the name of them now. There's a, there's a company that does all this stuff, got a good online website. We can put, we'll put a link to it. It begins with V, v uh, not Virtus, but someone else. But they do a lot of this stuff in the UK and they can create schemes using digital. I mean, it won't, have, it won't help Dirk in South Africa, but there might be an equivalent uh, over there where you can be a little bit more creative about creating equity ownership in a business rather than somebody have to literally write out a big check for it they can't afford and don't really want to take on debt to do so. The other question he raised is how to compensate people. And again, that's how long is a piece of string. Ultimately, every business has to run profitably. What value does the person add to the business? Um, and you know, what are the what are the and what, what's the competitive marketplace out there? But what are their skills worth out there? So, my advice to the advisor in this situation is just make yourself you know irreplaceable, which comes back to being able to build and grow a client bank, be able to engage with human beings, be able to you know do do all the right things such that your employer will pay you kind of higher than higher higher than market rate. When I started all those years ago, there was there was a rule of thumb which was kind of a third, a third, a third, which the advisor received a third of the total revenue attached to the clients he looked after. Uh, the, the company who owned the business, or the owner got um, a third of the gross revenue to you know, cover the overheads. Uh, and a third was used to pay the overheads, you know, all the sort of operational stuff that goes on. That remains not a million miles bad rule of thumb. It's probably a bit generous, because there's a lot more costs now than used to be in terms of compliance and all the sort of infrastructure that applies. But um, that, that's a place to start, really. If someone's running a book of business with a you know 200,000 of ongoing or, or, or revenue of any description, then maybe 20 to 30% of that might be a, a, a starting point for the discussion in terms, of, in terms of comp. But of course, it depends on what, what all the other benefits are that the employer provides. So not a crystal clear answer, but it's not, it's not a... Okay, not it is a deep one. Carl, do you have any input? Um, do you know what this is? This is 
it, it's impossible to answer it uh, because there are so many answers. Um, even yeah. talking, uh, Alan was talking about you know growth shares or whatever. Th- there are so many tax implications around all of that. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know if I can succinctly give an answer here that will actually benefit. Just- I I I'd be very happy to talk to Dirk directly on this one, but um, I. I assure you, I've tried pretty much everything over my long and varied career. It's, it seems to be a so, recurring, a yeah, recurring I, I, yeah, I don't think, You were going to say something? Yeah. I, I'm a fan of own 100% of the business. Keep it simple. Just pay them really well. Next. Yeah, and also with Dirk, of course, we, as, as Alan alluded to and Carl to a degree, you've got this fact, the different tax situations. You know, there's different tax situations in the UK to Ireland as there is to South Africa. So it really is a... That really is a, a deep, a deep conversation. Um, okay, so that's three more questions, three more Trappist questions that we've that we've cleared out of the sack. So please do submit your Trappist questions if you have one. The link in the so-called show notes or the link at the uh, pin tweet at Advisor Podcast. Without any further ado, let's move on to Culture Corner. And we've got four here. Uh, I'll go first. Just get out of the way. So. There's another uh, money money podcast out there. This this is one of the pretty awful ones, the FT Money Show podcast. But I I just have it there because now and again they get someone on who's vaguely interesting, and they have someone on who is vaguely interesting. Stuart Kirk, the ex head of sustainable investing at HSBC, who got uh, well, I think he admitted Brilliant. he got he got sacked. Um, he made a speech last year in in um, which he made he made some sort of offhand <laughs> sort of risque comments for someone in his field. But actually, what he was saying was pretty common sense. The, the one thing that he talks about in the podcast was the quote he made in his speech was saying, well, who cares if Miami's underwater in in in, in, in 60 years or 100 years? Because we'll find a way around it. Uh, Amsterdam has been underwater, un- lower than the level of the ocean for hundreds of years. And human ingenuity gets us through these things. But that didn't go. That, that's not what the audience wanted to hear. And that's not what the zeitgeist wants to hear. So he got sacked. But he was quite good on this podcast. Just very transparent. The guy is very, very honest about his situation. He's been divorced. Um and he's got a column now in the FT where he just talks about his investment decisions through his SIP. And all he has got in the world is his SIP. And, he's, and he talks about his own money situation in a way that British people don't generally do. And I imagine Irish people don't generally do as well. And he says, all I've got is my SIP. It's worth £471,000. That is my worth after my divorce. And this is what I'm doing with it. So he's quite an engaging guy. So there's a link to that in the, <laughs> in the um, so-called show notes. Um, Mr. Widger, you have a Culture Corner item for us. Yeah, I actually think I might have put this one up before, uh, but it it, it cropped up uh, this week because uh, Stephanie Bogan put out a tweet. Everybody should follow Stephanie. She's very um, interesting and full of life and has been there, done that in terms of real financial planning and bought and sold firms before. Uh, She asked, what book would you recommend to a business looking to grow or expand? And I said, Cameron Harold, uh, Vivid Vision. It's a short book. It's really impactful, and if you are looking to grow a a kind of a, a business like ours, um, I think it's really, really good starting point for everybody. Um, so that's why I recommend Cameron Harrow. Okay, great stuff. Vivid Mr. Vision. Smith, you have uh, no, uh, Morgan Housel, the, 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 the guy who just can't get enough lunches with you and Mr. Hart. Yeah, not again, Morgan. Come on. Um but just, just before I do, I've just remembered the name of that website back to Dirk. Uh, it's called Vested, V-E-S-T-D, uh, on, if he wants to know about share schemes and so on. So that's just an, an extra culture corner for you for those in that game. Yes, mine was, um, I am a fan of, I know you might not be, I'm a fan of Professor Scott Galloway and all the stuff that he puts out. He's, um, yeah, he's a, he's a professor at, of marketing, I think, at New York Stern University. He's recently become a neighbor of mine. He've moved, he's moved into my neighborhood. He's moved from the States to London. And, to and I'm hoping I, I – I, I, no. <laughs> he's Killed in Martin himself. <laughs> he's uh, – yeah. Um, I'm ho- yeah, I'm stalking him. I'm, 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 um, I'm walking around Regent's Park over morning to see if I can bump into him because he walks his dog there regularly oh, according to God. his Twitter profile. Anyway, he has got a really good – podcast i think and he interviews really interesting people and his most recent one though he does he interviews morgan house so most people listening to this podcast will at least be aware of morgan house so he has written in my opinion one of one of the best books on personal finance called the psychology of money and yeah that's the most recent episode of the prof g professor galloway 
podcast. Uh, really good, really insightful, definitely worth you know 50 minutes of your time to tune Great into Great stuff. Yeah, I, again, the way I kind of like him, but it's another one that's got Trump derangement syndrome and he just goes off on one and it's like Sam Harris. They've just lost their bearings a little bit when they get into that area. Uh, Mr. Hart, you have the final Culture Corner item, I think. Yeah, Prof G. I read his blog every Friday quite religiously. I think it's, I think it's decent. I also went on one of his courses uh, a couple of years back. So, yeah, big fan of his work, mainly his written work. And he's got great graphs and charts in his um, in his two emails that he issues every week. So I recommend you subscribe to them. <laughs> uh, my recommendation the two boys, is... The two boys applying for a lunch date with, with Prof G. <laughs> yeah. But I don't, well, I don't Alan, think you're going to get invited, Prof right? Alan goes in the morning and I go at lunchtime. So we, we've got the whole day covered in uh, in Regent's Park. One day we'll see him. One day. One day we'll grab him. Just like I ran into Terry Smith and that went successfully well. Well, that's okay, another story. I'll share that another time. So uh, so my yeah, recommendation on. is Charlie Munger. I'm a huge fan of Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. Obviously, they work together. But Charlie also is a chairman of another company called The Daily Journal. And every year... He sits down with the shareholders of the Daily Journal and answers questions like he does with Mr. Warren Buffett for Berkshire Hathaway, but he does it on his own with the um, the current manager of the Daily Journal. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, it came out, the 2022 meeting, published in 2023. So search YouTube um, and you can find it there. The interesting thing, um, they asked questions on the fly to Charlie Munger. And one of the questions came in from one of the shareholders based somewhere around the world, but the shareholder used chat GPT to ask a question of Charlie Munger. Uh, and the question was, uh, you know, what's the number one mental bias uh, that people struggle to overcome? Uh, and chat GPT came up with this question. Uh, and Charlie Munger says, uh, after a, a little bit of thought around that, he said, I think the, uh, the number one mental bias for people to overcome is denial. Um, and then he went on to talk about denial in some detail, but he made he made specific reference to the wealth management industry, where the whole business of wealth management, investment management specifically, uh, and you know the destruction of wealth versus just leaving it in the markets and obviously charging heavily, you know that's obviously why you know you're never going to beat the index over you know a meaningful period of time because you know helpers help themselves to fees. That's what they always say. But he goes on and on and on about extreme denial in the wealth management business where a widow comes to someone with £500,000 and they're going to charge them 1% a year. You know, the person does what's good for them, not for the client. And him and Buffett have got a real, real thing about this at the moment. But um, yeah, I thought that was quite interesting. So my recommendation is Charlie Munger Daily Journal 2022 meeting. Um, but I thought that was interesting that they used chat GBT to ask a question that he thought was a very good question. Then he answered it by saying the biggest mental bias to overcome is denial. Um, that's it, Nick. Over to you. Just before you take off, uh, Nick, for those who um, the vast majority of people consume this podcast on audio, a few a few watch on YouTube, a growing number. If you watch on YouTube, you just look at Nick's face when people mention certain words or phrases to 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 judge his views on it. Andy mentions Chat GPT. His face, his look on his face is just Seth, so Seth bleeding out. Said, yeah, exactly. There was another one. Hilarious. Uh, and they'll also they'll also see that I was deeply uncomfortable with the content <laughs> of some of today's yeah, podcast, yeah. owing to the Irish uh, versus UK cultural differences, which are enormous. Which I'm always trying to tell you, boys. You guys but are you never the domain me. of the but boy anyway, band. I'd like to apologize. I would like to apologize. You are the domain to of the, the boy Irish band. It's, it's a it's a credit. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a debit. Okay, wrap wrap it up there, yeah, Nicholas. But I, but I think, I, no, but I think we do. We should say just before we, we finish, we should do a bit of shout out to the Irish community who are fantastic. We also have spent plenty of time over there, because guess what? Last time we looked, this podcast against all the odds was number eight in the top ten podcasts in Ireland with all with Pro Prof G and Tim Ferriss and all this sort of Stephen Bartlett, the top podcast. It might not be after <laughs> this episode goes out, but currently we're a top ten pod in Ireland. So. Incredible. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, Ireland. Except it's gone Thank from you, PG to 18. <laughs> Okay, that's dear a wrap for this dear. episode. Thank you, Trappist, for your dear, precious time oh and your input into the show. Rate us, leave a six out of five star review on iTunes, like and subscribe on the YouTube. Until the next time, from the Trap Pack, it's adios and take care out there, folks. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>